One of the big issues of our time is health care. And once again, the state is pretending to ride in on a white horse and save us all from the horrors of the free market. Once again, we libertarians find all of these arguments to be iffy at best, and we find it infuriating that all of our evidence and counterarguments keep falling on deaf ears, as we keep hearing the same bogus claims over and over and over again. So in the interest of furthering the conversation, and keeping in mind that since the state is force, the burden of proof is on the statists, this edition of our How to Argue for Statism series will be a list of some of the things you need to keep in mind if you want to convince us that universal health care is the best system. 1. Stop comparing universal health care to the American system. I don't know how often this needs to be said, I don't know how long it'll take to sink in with you people, but we aren't in favor of the U.S. healthcare system. It's a statist, corporatist system, and we don't like it any better than your statist solution. We weren't even in favor of it before Obamacare was passed. The current U.S. healthcare system is the result of over half a century of government meddling, and Obamacare only made it worse. Continuing in this failed direction of greater government control, fewer patient choices, and more insurance and special interest cronyism. We fully acknowledge the problems you point out with the U.S. healthcare system. We agree and have provided evidence that these problems will be minimized or eliminated entirely with a free market healthcare system, with none of the problems that UHC countries experience. So you do not get to argue for your crappy statist healthcare system by comparing it to another crappy statist healthcare system. Really, all this does is tell us that you're nothing but a cultist. This is cult mentality, the we and the not we. Universal healthcare is the we, and so you get to be against anything that doesn't conform with your holy writ, no thinking required. And libertarian free market reforms get lumped in with the corporatist and cronyist monstrosities that we despise a lot more than you do, because much of this same corporatism exists with UHC, too. The U.S. healthcare system is much closer to what you favor than to what we favor, and has been for decades. 2. Stop calling healthcare a right If you support UHC by saying we have a right to healthcare, all you do is make it clear you don't even know what a right is, and this is something that has pervaded the healthcare discussion since day one. Rights happen in a negative sense, meaning that they negate the kinds of things that others can do to you. And if you're confused by what that means, just look at how your side continually resorts to the use of passive voice, which hides the subject of the sentence. For example, you have a right to be cared for when you're sick. But cared for by whom? No rights work this way. Your right to free speech does not mean you get to force someone else to give you a stage. Your right to free press does not mean you get to force someone else to pay for your printing press or print your tract in their newspaper. Your right to keep and bear arms does not mean you get to force someone else to give you a gun or pay for your gun or anything like that. Passive voice is a huge indication that something not very good is going on. In order to violate your right to free speech or free press, someone would have to come and shut you up or stop your publication. In order to violate that right to own a gun, someone would have to steal a gun or arrest you or whatever. That's what we mean by rights being negative. They negate the ability of others to do things to you. But inherent in the right to free health care is the idea that you're entitled to someone else's labor and resources. You're entitled to have a doctor or a hospital or whatever care for you, and you're entitled to make someone else pay for it. Because if that's your right, then apparently that's all the things that you can demand. Rights do not work that way, people. Get over it. That's not what a right is. You do not have the right to someone else's time or labor or money. If you do, you are saying that that other person is your slave. So if we do have a right to health care, then we have that right in a negative sense. And I absolutely believe that we do have a right to health care in the proper sense of the word right, which means the government absolutely cannot interfere in your right to obtain health care however you legitimately can, meaning going out and buying it or getting some charity to take care of it for you, going to a free clinic or charity hospital or something like that. Every time government interferes, every time government says, we think your insurance plan needs to cover this and that, 
Every time the government says, we think doctors should spend several hours a day filling out paperwork, every time government says, we're not going to let you have your medicine unless it's been FDA approved, every time government says, if your doctor says the medicine you need is marijuana, we're going to arrest you and put you in jail if you take it. Those are things that interfere with the actual right to health care. That's what's so stupid about this. And that's why you have to disguise it with things like passive voice. You're trying to make out like it's a right because who's against rights? You're not against rights, are you? How can you be against someone's rights? What's the matter with you? But that's not what this is about. If this were really about our right to health care, you would be working to get government out of it. Because when government was out of health care, as I and others have shown many times before, we took care of each other. Health care was cheap. Insurance was cheap. There were other things such as mutual aid societies that competed with insurance. And there were free clinics and charity hospitals all over the place to take care of the few people who couldn't afford that. And then, of course, people came in and said, Oh, we have the right to health care. Let's get government involved. And that ended up in the mess we're in today. And don't pretend like this isn't happening or you didn't understand this. If you did, you never would have used the passive voice. You never would have left out the subject of the sentence, the person who has to provide this service or pay for it. Or covered it up in some other way, like saying, But it's our tax money. We all pay for it. Or we're just wanting people to pay their fair share or whatever. By trying to couch it this way, you make it clear that you know this is wrong. Because if you didn't, if you stated it directly and honestly, it would be blatantly clear you're saying that you have the right to the fruits of someone else's labor. And you must agree with us that that's a bad thing. Otherwise, you would never have gone to such lengths to hide it. 3. Acknowledge the problems with universal health care. One of the big things that statists use against libertarians is the nirvana fallacy. That if they can just point out one problem with libertarianism, it proves we should go with the state. But when we point out problems with the state, they just go with, well, nothing's perfect. They can't have it both ways. You also can't use the best game in town fallacy either. None of this excuses problems with your system. Problems with your system must be acknowledged and addressed. The biggest example with UHC, which pervades each and every form of it that has ever been implemented, is rationing. I have covered case after case after case after case after case of countries with universal health care engaging in rationing. There are places in Canada where whether or not you can see a doctor that month depends on whether or not you win a lottery. Throughout Canada, there are huge wait lists, which Canadian politicians try to say is a good thing because it equalizes access. In Sweden, there is someone who decides whether or not you deserve an ambulance at the time, and there are people dying of heart attacks and other problems because some bureaucrat on the other end of the phone, even if it is a bureaucrat with a nursing degree, without actually being at the scene, without actually examining the person or anything like that, just decided that they didn't get an ambulance. Hey, say what you like against the current U.S. healthcare system, and there's a lot you can say against it, but at least if you call an ambulance, you get one. And in the UK, with their wonderful, magical NHS, there are hideous wait times where people have treatable illnesses which, by the time they get off the waiting list months later, have progressed to the point where it's untreatable. Many UK citizens have to raise money for life-saving surgery or go to another country to get it. The NHS outright denies vital operations. And for crying out loud, they're actually starving elderly people to death to free up bed space. This is rationing, people! It's rationing! It's just like in World War II. You have to have this many points if you want to eat meat this week. Well, they may as well do that. They may as well say, okay, here's the number of points you have, and that determines how much health care you're entitled to. It's exactly the same. It's just hidden and more nefarious. And remember number one. We have this problem in the U.S. too. The AMA, by stacking licensing boards with their cronies, artificially restricts the number of medical licenses states give out to keep their paychecks sky high. People wanting to build new hospitals have to file a statement of need in order to get permission to do so. And more often than not, this has to be approved by other hospitals in the area. In other words, the very people they're going to be competing against. Yes, we know, your politicians keep promising to do better. 
But that raises another interesting point. 4. Explain why your politicians keep promising to fix your system while exempting themselves from it. It didn't take Obama long to start letting his buddies get out of many of the restrictions of Obamacare. By the same token, politicians and their cronies throughout UHC countries exempt themselves from their country's universal health care system. Why? If it's so wonderful, why aren't they the first in line to get it? Or could it be it's not so wonderful after all, just something that's only fit for the peasantry? At the same time, you also might want to explain why fixing your dreadful health care system is pretty much always a major election issue, as these Canadian commercials and news stories show. Nearly five million people can't find a family doctor. <coughs> and I'm the only leader with a plan to hire the doctors and nurses that Canadian families need. Well, an overcrowded hospital has to use a donut shop as an emergency ward. And five million Canadians don't have a doctor. The federal government told the cancer agency it would not be paying for his chemotherapy. Sister Carol Borison is speaking for him. This gentleman's life was on the line and the amount of anxiety and stress that had been added to his situation was awful. ...is to encourage people who are seeking ER care uh, to, uh, if, if, uh, if they can use the, uh, the health line, and then determine whether or not they can be dealt with at a walk-in clinic. Again, uh, we have the health region estimating that 15 to 20 percent of ER cases can be dealt with at a walk-in clinic. He says, what is the government doing to ensure that we mitigate against this problem? 1,160 fewer health care workers under their regime, 450 fewer RNs from 01 to 06, 173 less doctors practicing during their last five years, 155 less pharmacists pharmacists and 95 fewer physios, Mr. Speaker. It's not even elect me and I'll make health care even better. It's all about the problems and how they need to be fixed. We have YouTube now. We can read your newspapers with a quick Google News search. We can see what people in your own country are saying about your own health care system. So don't pretend like we're a bunch of ignoramuses and try to pull the wool over our eyes by saying how wonderful your system is when people in your own country don't even believe that. Of course, your politicians know that, but thanks to the state cultist mindset, they get away with blaming people in the other party. But that just brings me to the next item. 5. Stop blaming others for these problems. The Canadians love to blame Stephen Harper and the Conservative Party. In the UK, the scapegoat is David Cameron and the Tories. And usually it's targeted at people who are just trying to get these ridiculous budgets under control. The thing is, none of this passes the smell test. In the UK, they're blaming Tory cuts for long wait times and denial of basic services and even vital surgeries. But the NHS is still paying for boob jobs! Sorry, but you don't get to claim that it's the result of those nasty budget cutters while you're still paying for completely elective cosmetic surgery. Not to mention the fact that we see these problems in UHC countries no matter who is in power. For example, back when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, he was confronted by an elderly lady who pulled out seven of her own teeth because she was put on a long waiting list but just couldn't stand the pain any longer. Blair told her, The problem is, I cannot just produce more dentists. The thing is, we know why these problems exist in UHC systems, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with who's in power at the time. And you'd understand this, too, if you would just... 6. Learn some economics already. In the U.S., believe it or not, we don't really have much of a healthcare problem. There's nothing really wrong with our doctors or hospitals or the procedures that are available. Most anywhere in the U.S., you can get top-notch care. The problems we have stem from how damn gum expensive it is. When a hospital stay costs you $2,000 a night, not including the actual medical procedures and everything else you need, it makes a dent in the old pocketbook. People bemoan, and rightly so, how this can bankrupt people and make it more difficult for the poor to get health care. But here's the thing you need to understand. This makes the health care issue fundamentally an economic issue and you are in no position whatsoever to be offering solutions to an economic issue unless you understand at least some basic economics. I mentioned rationing earlier. Those of us who are economically literate know how to solve this problem. The price mechanism. And no, that doesn't mean that the price goes sky high and poor people miss out. That happens when your precious government intervenes. In a free market, this is a signal to people to build more clinics and hospitals, or to become doctors or nurses or dentists. 
or to innovate newer and better and more efficient ways of doing things, and thereby increase the supply. Which, as anyone who's ever looked at a supply-demand graph will tell you, lowers prices and increases quantities. Unlike Tony Blair's NHS, a free market can just produce more dentists. More health care becomes available at a lower price. How can that possibly be a bad thing? Rationing exists for one reason only. Because someone, either the government directly or a cartelized system, is trying to hold prices down artificially instead of bringing them down naturally by increasing supply. It's no different from what happened during World War II. The rationing I mentioned earlier happened after the U.S. government printed up a bunch of money to fund the war effort, and this resulted in inflation, which the government tried to correct for by freezing wages and the price of many goods such as meat, butter, and eggs. But since these prices were held artificially low, they needed to stop people running to the store and buying them all up so that no one else could get them. So people were issued points based on the size of their family, which permitted you to buy a certain amount of these items every week. Understand, no matter what you do, all of these healthcare services have to be paid for somehow. Canadians brag about how much cheaper their drugs are than in the U.S., but that's only true of name brand drugs, and only because those prices are capped. Generics in Canada cost three to five times as much as they do in the U.S. because that's the only way to recoup the loss. Prices vary widely all over Canada, but it's fairly typical for an antibiotic to cost 10 Canadian dollars with a $9 dispensing fee, a total of about 17 U.S. dollars. Whereas pretty much anywhere in the U.S., you can get the same generic antibiotics for $4 at Walmart, Target, and other pharmacies. At least in a somewhat marketized environment, we're allowed to see the problem, such as in the U.S., where people in hospitals are charged something like $5 for two aspirin. That's the hospital recouping losses in other areas. We see the problem directly, and this fuels the very justifiable indignation about it. But when government starts covering it, these problems don't go away. They're just made so that they aren't visible to the people. The problems are hidden from view, not solved. Again, the real solution is to let prices work. And if you deny for some reason that this works in healthcare, let's look at a few areas where there is relatively little regulation. One is cosmetic surgery. Unlike the NHS, if you want a boob job in the U.S., you have to pay for it yourself. There aren't even many insurance plans that cover it, except as reconstructive surgery after a mastectomy. As a result, breast augmentations start around $3,000. Compare that with a simple appendectomy, which can cost tens of thousands of dollars. LASIK is another example. Again, it's not covered by insurance, but consumer demand and competition have gotten the price down to $1,500 to $3,000, with quality increasing dramatically. Probably the clearest example is the defibrillator. This is the thing you see on TV where they shout clear and give someone's heart a jolt to get him going again. The procedure of doing this without surgically opening the chest dates back to the 1950s. But for years, it could only be operated by a licensed physician. Then, nurses and rescue workers lobbied to have this regulation removed. And ever since then, lives have been saved. Not only did nurses no longer have to wait for a doctor to arrive to use it, but emergency first responders could bring defibrillators to the scene and save even more lives. Then something funny happened. Firefighters and other rescue workers wanted to be able to use them too. This resulted in defibrillators becoming not only more portable, but easier to use. And cheaper as well. Now, we have automatic defibrillators, which started just under $1,000, which pretty much anyone can use with minimal training. Many heart patients have acquired these and used them to save their own lives. Competition and market forces work to make healthcare more affordable and more available for everyone. Whereas government intervention only makes things more expensive and less available. And the only way to keep costs down in such a situation is to fix a price ceiling which always results in rationing. Something else you need to understand. Technology makes things cheaper. We're sick and tired of your worn-out old line about how healthcare gets more expensive because of new technologies. There has never been a time when technology has been shown to result in increased costs, and there is no production function anywhere in any school of economics where the technology component results in higher costs instead of lower costs. So knock it off already. No, there is nothing about healthcare whatsoever that makes it immune to the laws of economics. 
7. Stop pretending the profits are bad or that profit-seeking doesn't exist in your system. As Lord T. Hawkeye has pointed out, everyone does the things they do because they believe the results of their actions will be worth the costs. A more cynical way of putting it would be because it seemed like a good idea at the time. But the fact of the matter is, if we didn't figure the results of our actions will be worth whatever time and money and energy we put into it, we just wouldn't do it. We'd find something more worthwhile to do. That's all profit is, folks. That's all it is. The gains exceed the costs. So anyone who talks of profit as if it's a bad thing is a hypocrite. Nothing more. On a related note, stop pretending that a government-run healthcare system is the only way to do a non-profit healthcare system. As if the free market hasn't been making non-profit organizations all over the place, we have non-profit hospitals and clinics and everything else, but here's the thing. Even a non-profit charitable organization has to worry about taking in more money than they spend. If they operate in the red for too long, pretty soon, they won't be able to exist anymore. You accuse free markets of being greedy and exploitative, but you fail to do anything to show how human nature magically changes when your wonderful government steps in. And there's a reason why. Because if anything, it gets worse. You, with some justification, accuse doctors in the U.S. of profiting by prescribing certain medicines for which they get kickbacks. But again, you don't turn the same eye towards your own country. For example, in the U.K., doctors get paid more when they give statins to their patients, when statins should only be considered after lifestyle changes have been implemented, and even then, there's some controversy about their use. The U.K. remains the statins capital of Europe, with some 40% of the adult population being advised to take them, far more than it is in the U.S. Even in the U.S., they're overprescribed according to most experts, but in the U.K., it's much worse. Since we've established that this really is an economic issue, the solution to problems of access to health care is to let the profit motive do what it does best in a free market, find the maximum utility for the maximum number of people. It takes government to make profits that you didn't really earn as they compete for crony status in a zero-sum market, but a free market doesn't work that way. A free market is positive-sum, not zero-sum, and so the only way a company can profit is by giving you a benefit that you consider to be at least as valuable as the money you spent on their product or service. We just aren't buying your tired old line about how they'll turn away poor people because it's not profitable. Whenever you have a number of people that are disenfranchised in a free market, no matter how poor they are, that's an incentive for a profit-seeking entrepreneur to figure out how to use our limited resources to meet their desires. That's why the poor in the U.S. can afford cell phones and computers and high-definition TVs. These things used to be so expensive they were way out of the reach of the poor and even much of the middle class. It was profit-seekers in a competitive market that made these products available at prices even the poor can afford. But that's not what your governments do with healthcare. New innovations in healthcare are all but stifled in UHC countries. And even here in America, this desire to stop the rich from exploiting the poor, a meaningless catchphrase which exists solely to justify the unjustifiable, has stifled things like the MRI. Like any new technology, MRIs were expensive when they first came out. Thanks to the early adopter effect, the initial higher price makes the future price of new technologies go down to the point where the poor can easily afford them. This is what happened with smartphones. But with the MRI, the government can set a price cap to prevent exploitation of the poor, you see, and this effect was stopped in its tracks. Now, at a time when computers and other forms of technology are a fraction of the price they were, despite being far greater quality, MRIs are still way expensive and very difficult for the uninsured in almost any socioeconomic class to afford. The reason why is your government, not entrepreneurs in a free market who would have loved to get the price down so everyone could afford it. Even when technology isn't an issue, profit-seeking saves lives. Presently, organ donors in most countries have to be put on these long waiting lists where there aren't anywhere near enough organs for them all, and so most of them die. Iran is a country that doesn't do much right as far as healthcare is concerned, but it is the one place in the world where it's legal to sell your kidney, and as a result, Iran has no waiting lists for kidney transplantation. In the Philippines, sales of organs was legal up until 2008. Up to this point, the Philippines not only had enough organs to cover their own population, but was also a popular destination for medical tourists needing transplants. 
Since the ban, the number of available organs has dropped dramatically, and there are waiting lists again. A similar thing happened in India in 1994, when a ban of organ sales took India from having the biggest kidney transplant centers in the world to waiting lists. And yet, shamefully, there have been no major studies published in prominent medical journals of the effects of these bans on donors or patients. Understand, most of the names on those waiting lists are future corpses, people who have families that will grieve for them, and may even depend on them for part or most of their livelihood. I know the line of bull, selling organs exploits the poor. You just love that phrase, don't you? Since it allows you to condemn the other side without making any actual argument. But here's the reason why you're a hypocrite. Even in UHC countries, everyone gets to profit from organ transplants except the donor. Doctors and hospitals get paid for it, and there are even structures in place where hospitals can sell organs to each other when needed. But now, consider the grieving family. They've lost a loved one. They now have a lot of funeral expenses, and they're in even bigger trouble if the person they lost was a breadwinner. It could really help them tremendously if they could sell their loved one's organs and get a good amount of money to help them through this. So tell me, why should everyone get to profit from organ transplantation except the donor's family? And so, to avoid exploiting the poor and to avoid the evils of profit, you put grieving families in financial hardship while the corpses of those needing transplants pile higher and higher. Don't you dare call libertarians heartless if you take this position. 8. Either justify rationing or come up with a solution for it. We've pretty much established that rationing is inevitable with government health care. The only solution that economists have come up with is the price mechanism. As long as the price is forced below equilibrium, you'll need rationing to prevent shortages. So if you want to continue to advocate UHC, you need to do one of two things. You can try to justify rationing, but understand that you can't use equalizing access as an excuse the way Canadian ministers do. It's far better to be unequal with better options than equal but stuck in long waiting lists. If I make $20,000 a year and you make $100,000, we're both better off than if we both make $10,000. Equality just isn't always what it's cracked up to be. Not when you have elderly ladies pulling their own teeth out or left to die on the Liverpool Care pathway because there aren't enough beds. Or come up with another solution. Find something other than the price mechanism which allows for increasing supply while keeping prices as low as possible and prove that it will work. And then publish it in an economics journal and win the Nobel Prize. 9. Answer the question in this video. See. Here's the thing. We have lots of suggestions for how to make healthcare better and how to fix these problems. And unlike you, we don't base ours on pie-in-the-sky magical thinking that if we just turn it all over to government, everything will work out for some unexplained reason despite all the observable facts. This video covers several of them, and in all this time, no one has been able to answer the question asked throughout this video. Can you give me one good, solid, rational, defensible reason for not trying these solutions? See, if you want to convince people, you have to listen to what they say and actually respond to it. Consider their arguments, their objections, and their point of view, and craft a response to it instead of pulling out talking points from your favorite pundits. We've done you this courtesy. Every single thing mentioned in this video is based on what proponents of UHC have claimed and how they say it will work. We took those on. We considered those. We looked at the evidence and we've crafted our responses. This is just one of those responses. Now it's your turn. If you want to claim the intellectual high ground, then you need to convince us with rational arguments and real world data. That's what it means to work in a peaceful voluntary system. Except, of course, UHC isn't a peaceful voluntary system, so... 10. As always, acknowledge the gun in the room. The reason why that old lady had to pull her own teeth out is because government pointed guns at people. Or at least the threat of guns was always there. If you don't believe me, then what do you think would happen if you didn't pay the portion of your taxes that goes to health care? If UHC is really such a good system, then no one should have a problem paying into it. 
the only reason you'd have to use force to make people pay it is because you're afraid it isn't such a good system after all. If you're worried about free riders, well, you're already taking care of that. The NHS has implemented a policy where anyone who's come to the country from outside the European Union and hence hasn't paid taxes to the NHS and who needs healthcare services gets charged. Okay, fair enough. You didn't pay into it, so you don't get it for free. Except for one niggling little problem. They're charging people 150% of the cost of the service. So if you're an American and you go to Britain and you break your arm, you need to pay for your broken arm and half of someone else's. How is that justified? And if that weren't ridiculous enough, the data show that the UK loses far more people to healthcare tourism as they go to the US or India or Jordan or somewhere where they won't have to wait in these long lines than there are foreigners that they care for. The tax money gained from those who get healthcare elsewhere should be more than enough to cover them. Healthcare tourism should be a net benefit to the NHS. What is this but an admission of complete and total failure? And by the way, how would you react if a private company did something like that? Admit it, you'd hit the ceiling, wouldn't you? Stop giving your precious government a pass. Or at the very least... 11. Show how the ends justify the means. Dead people on organ transplant lists. Dead elderly because there aren't enough beds for them. Old ladies pulling their own teeth out. People left to die of heart attacks because they don't deserve an ambulance. People forced to take the expense to go elsewhere in the world to get a life-saving procedure. I don't care what else you have to say. This is horrific and should never be tolerated. There is a procedure that's been done successfully for decades in the U.S. called selective dorsal rhizotomy, which is given to children with cerebral palsy and helps them avoid lifelong disabilities. There are few complications and hardly any long-term adverse effects. And most of the children who have this operation grow up with no outward sign of any disability, being able to walk or even run like anyone else. And yet, the NHS is only now considering offering this. They're doing a pilot program in five hospitals to 120 children. NHS officials are trying to make this sound like a new and experimental procedure that they need to test first and see if it works. This is an outright lie. Children in the UK with cerebral palsy are growing up with lifelong disabilities, even being wheelchair-bound, when they don't have to. That is beyond unconscionable. It is downright evil. So don't you dare complain about a capitalist healthcare system until you deal with this. Show how having your wonderful government in charge of healthcare is worth all these lost lives, all this pain and suffering, all this misery that is so easily preventable. No, the free market isn't perfect. It has its inequalities and people who fall through the cracks and things that don't seem fair. But it's hardly the case that these problems go away with UHC. Quite the contrary, there are so many additional problems on top of these that it's flabbergasting to us that you could defend it with a straight face and then have the audacity to call us heartless. We believe that instead of pursuing free health care, which is an unobtainable utopia, we should pursue good health care and let the market cover as many people as it possibly can. And then we'll work together to help those few who fell through the cracks, who didn't really get a fair deal. But in order to do that, You'll have to actually be compassionate, not have your precious government be compassionate for you so you don't have to. If you want to argue against free market health care, then understand that you cannot do that with the tactics and the fallacies I've listed here. You need to step up your game and defend your system with facts and rational arguments. And if you can't, then at least admit there's a good possibility that you might be wrong.